Hello, I'm Ray Parker, one of the teachers at Rincon First Christian Church. I'm teaching the series of International Sunday School Lessons uh, for this summer quarter. Uh, lessons on Wisdom Literature. Today is a lesson for July 26th. Wisdom to Follow. Today's text is taken from the book of John, uh, a very familiar passage with many people who are Christians. Uh, John 14, the first uh, 14 verses. The remainder of this quarter's lesson for the book for the month of August will be taken from the book of James. So those last five lessons will be from that book. But today ends our gospel study, basically, with this fourth lesson in the book of John. Before we get into the lesson proper, may we pause for prayer. Father God, we come to you to thank you that you have left for us your word. You've given for, uh, to us your spirit that we may have the combination of the guidance from those two uh, those two entities from you that we may be found acceptable in your sight as we go through this passage today may you give me the remembrance and the insight to say the words that we need to hear uh, from you uh, we thank you father in the name of jesus amen what does god look like We've probably asked that question ourselves, or we stated it maybe another way, I'd like to see God. And oftentimes we think God looks like us, or turn that around, we look like God, primarily from that passage in Genesis where he created Adam and Eve, uh, where he said he created him in his own image. Is that the physical image or is that the spiritual image? Then, of course, we have those, those appearances that uh, God made for himself or he made in the pre-incarnation Jesus or either an angel. When he appeared to Hagar, he appeared to Abraham and Sarah, he appeared to Gideon, he, appear, he appeared to uh, Samuel, uh, Samson's parents. Uh, and so, so we have that concept that we look like God or God looks like us. And then, of course, uh, the clincher seems always to have been that of Jesus. And we know that he had a heavenly father and an earthly mother, and so he came to look like us. And then, of course, we have that last passage that we consider in 1 John, where it says, when he appears, we will be like him. Again, is that going to be in our physical appearance or is that going to be in our spiritual appearance? Whatever the case is, we've always had this idea of, of wanting to, to see God or, or to see His appearance. Our lesson today from 1 John is a passage that is used in many funerals because it's a passage that Jesus uh, appears to be giving confidence and giving assurance to his apostles because he has just finished uh, talking to them about his coming death and he has rebuked Peter for Peter saying, no, that's not going to happen to you. And so in this passage, there's this, there's this comfort, there's this uh, peace that Jesus is trying to give to these apostles and of course to us uh, and even in this day that that he's going to be with us he's not going to abandon us he's not going to leave us and so through the difficulties and troubles of life uh, Jesus assures these apostles and he assures us that he will never leave us or forsake us that he will be there with us so let's turn and look at this passage because in it we see a lot of Jesus' purpose, uh, his identity, and his mission in this passage uh, today. So, 1 John 14, 
verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Here Jesus connects belief in Jehovah to believe in himself. These Jewish men who had followed him had a deep belief in Jehovah God. And so Jesus is saying to them, if you believe him, and so he calls him Father, if you believe Father, then you must believe me. And so here's this connection between uh, the realities of God the Father and the realities of God the Son, who is the one and the same. For the faithful people of Israel and for the faithful people of today, we must understand that there is not many gods, there's not many ways to heaven, there's not many ways to please uh, Jehovah or God or the Father, but we come to this one concept of faith in Jesus who leads us to this faith in God as well. And so in verse 2 he says, In my Father's house are many rooms. The old King James said, mansions. And so we have those songs like Mansion Over the Hilltop or Build Me a Cabin in the Corner of Glory Land. And so we have this idea that Jesus says that there, there's a lot of space in God's house. Again, this is that assurance that where Jesus is going, that his followers, those who believe in him, will also go. There's a place for them. Rooms are usually translated as dwelling places or home. Jesus is going to make a home for these disciples that he's just said he will die and leave them in that sense. And it continues, If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? So this place, home, as a song once said, big house, is, then Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for those who follow me, who believe in me. Uh, again, that is not, he is saying, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to leave you forever. I'm going to prepare a place for you to be with me. Continuing, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. All he has done and all that he is about to do is to prepare a place for his followers. He's going to come back. We will see in a moment how even these apostles who had been with him for a number of months, uh, seemingly up to three years, had never really grasped all of that. But yet he, here he is trying to, to, to calm them and assure them after he says he's going to die that that's not all there is. There's going to be something more. That you will be where I am, where I'm going. I quoted earlier that first John passage. Uh, when he comes back, we will be like him. So he tells these disciples here now that he will, they will be with him. He doesn't give them a date. He doesn't give them a time. But he assures them that they will be with him. We have a passage uh, in Revelation 21, 3 that says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among people. And he will dwell with them they will be his people, and God himself will be, will be with them and be their God. Really, isn't that one of the things that, that people of faith has always wanted, is to be with God? Isn't that the, the thought, the, the hope of heaven, is of being with God? We're surrounded by pain and sorrow and sadness and evil and all the things around us on a daily basis. 
And we learn in scriptures that heaven is going to be a place without all of those things, all of those hardships. And we want to be in that place. We want to be with God. We want to be with Jesus. And so from, from Jesus' own words to the words in Revelation, there's those assurances that one day in time we will be with God. You know the way to the place where I am going. You know the place. They've been with Him a long time. He's talked about heaven. He's talked about all these uh, uh, events. And sometimes we, we like to we like to ridicule. We like to uh, uh, say how how dumb these apostles who had been with him for so long were and yet we have a lot more revelation than they did and we're still sort of dumb about these things too and so the next verse we have Thomas good old Thomas you got to love him he's so much like us uh, this is the, the first of two occasions where Thomas opens his mouth gives a, a reality check to what is going on. And again, like us, he says some things that he doesn't think through, he doesn't understand, but yet they come out. And for us, that makes it more real. So Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Did Thomas think he was going to go to uh, uh, the next village? Maybe back to Nazareth? Or maybe into Perea? Or maybe down to Egypt? So Thomas has this mind that you're talking about, we're supposed to know where you're going, and we don't know how to get there. We don't know where to go. Been there, done that? But we know Thomas, or our next verse, Philip, will not grasp these things. They will not come into a full understanding until after the resurrection in a few days. Uh, because again, we see Thomas asking that question after the resurrection. And uh, has to be proven to him who Jesus was again. So verse 6, Jesus, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am the means. Not only is He the means through His teaching, He's going to be the means through His death and resurrection. His is the way that we follow. His is the way that we look to to determine where we will be going. And since He's led the way, He's prepared the trail, we'll be able to follow in His footsteps in that sense. He says, I am the way, but I am also the truth. Truth. Later, Pilate would ask us, what is truth? Jesus says, I'm truth. Not that everything else in the world is false, but all truth is found in God. All truth is found in Jesus and His Word and His way. And I am the life. Way, truth, life. There is no eternal life outside of Jesus. There's no really no happy life outside of Jesus. There's really no peaceful life outside of Jesus. So He is life. And this next statement is one that people have not liked to believe through the centuries. In fact, the Judaizers of the first century and many groups like Jehovah Witnesses in this century 
have never accepted this concept that no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father but through me. To belong to Jesus, we have life. Not to belong to Jesus, we don't have life. We cannot have Jehovah God without Jesus Christ. We cannot have heaven without Jesus Christ. There's not many ways, only one way, to God. These two verses is the answer to Islam and to any other ism that's in the world. There's only one way to paradise. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to live with God eternally. Verse 7, If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. If you really know me. Now, they had been with Jesus. They had fellowship with Jesus, ate with Him, slept in the same camp. All those things for this moment of time. But did they really know Him? Thomas indicates he didn't. Philip indicates he doesn't. But Jesus says, if you know me, you will know my Father. Again, this, this equating Jesus and Jehovah God as one. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, have they known God or have they seen God? Only because they have seen Jesus. As we talked about in the introduction, this manifestation of God. People want to see God. Moses even asked to see God's face and God would not allow him to see his face. He saw his back. Uh, he saw uh, uh, some type of reflection of who God was, but... We know that the scripture says we, not, we cannot see God's face and live. But Jesus says you will know the Father because you know me. What you've seen in me, what you've experienced in me, you are experiencing the Father as well. Verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That, we will, be, that will be enough for us. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus just said. And so Philip, not understanding, about uh, the same way that Thomas didn't understand the way, Philip says, show us then. So I assume Philip wanted, wanted Jesus to uh, uh, bring down the screen, uh, show him a vision of what God looked like. And so Jesus answered in verse 9, Don't you know me? Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? What were they, what had they been seeing for these almost three years? They were seeing another man. They were not seeing a spirit being. They were understanding and seeing a man who had flesh and blood like them, who interacted and ate and slept and got tired like them. They saw him on the Sea of Galilee. They saw him doing miracles. And yet, they knew from their understanding of the Old Testament that many prophets did great miracles. And so they had never come to grasp with the fact that Jesus was more than just another prophet. Even though Peter had made that good confession recorded way back in Matthew, uh, that good confession was made in honesty, but not in total understanding. 
So Jesus has to say again, Don't you know me, Philip? You've been with me all this time. The Son and the Father share the same essence, the same entity, the same identity. God is one in nature, but three in persons. Giving and receiving perfect love without beginning or end. In this divine mystery, God is unlike any created being, only He is both one and three in this way. Verse 10, Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I, ha I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Now, the way Jesus answer, asked this question, he expects affirmative answer. Yes, that's what that's what you 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 teach. That's what you are. Yes, we accept your authority. Did they accept it on a mind level or heart level? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? First ten b. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work. The Father living in Jesus. The power that Jesus had was the power of the Father. We know that as Jesus is to leave them after the resurrection, He says, I will send you another, another comforter. I will send you the Spirit to be with you. And so, so, the disciples, the apostles of the first century had Jesus in their presence with the authority of God. Since Jesus has gone back to be with the Father, He left us His Spirit who will be that power of the Father to work in us because Jesus still makes some promises here that reflect that in us. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on the evidence in the works themselves. The works. Those miracles. Those things that they had seen Jesus perform. Those, those things that they could not identify any other way than being uh, out of the ordinary. Remember last week we talked about those things... Uh, that we that around us that we see every day as becoming ordinary in the sense that we don't think anything extraordinary about them anymore well this was the case here with these disciples with Jesus miracles they became old hand they knew Jesus could do that so they just did not connect the dots between the miracle and the man or the miracle of man and the power they were just following along, doing everyday things with Jesus, and yet they had become so used to the miraculous, so used to Jesus doing this, they lost sight of who was, who was He doing it through. But at least believe on the evidence, the works themselves. Note John here, never never writes a sentence that says, oh, we finally got it. Because we know they didn't get it until after the resurrection. It took a few more days before these apostles, these close ones of Jesus, could say, now we understand. This verse also gives us the reason for the miracles. They were not just done to help people, though they were, they were acts of compassion. We understand that. But Jesus indicates those miracles, those works that He did, was for verification. They were there to verify who He was, that His, his power was not His, but His power was coming through the, from the Father. And that all these works that he did was verification for them to say who he was, particularly later on in the Christian age. 
And that's, that's for us. We look back to the Scriptures. We look back to these four Gospels where we see Jesus doing all these things. Those are for us to see who He was and what His mission was. This is also one of the arguments that we can we still use while we don't necessarily need miracles today. Are they going to really convince a lot of people other than what we can show them in the Scriptures that Jesus did and the Apostles did? See, the Apostles didn't heal everybody. They didn't do all the, all the great things that they could have done with the power they had. They did those things that were used to convince audiences of that day that they were, they were ministers of Jesus. And so, do we really need miracle workers today? Oh, it would, it would be great if we could just reach out our hands and touch, but that's not necessarily what God has promised or the Scriptures promise. Uh, those works were there to verify. And we must understand that. Verse 12 is talking to these disciples, but it's also talking to us. Verily, truly, I tell you, whatever believers in me will do the works I have done, I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Whoever believes in me, what's the greater works? I just got through saying that it's not going to be doing miracles. But sharing the gospel is the greater work. Sharing the truth of God's word that He is the Christ, He's the Messiah. That's the greater work. The greater work of caring for people, not doing miracles to see food on the table, uh, not like the widow who's all uh, didn't run out, not those sorts of things, but the fact of taking His love and His mercy. And, and the goodness and sharing that with people, that's doing the greater works for today. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that, reason, the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now I know people are teaching that we have several verses in Scriptures, and this is two of them right here. That all we have to do is ask God and He has promised that He will deliver on a silver platter whatever we ask. But if you look at the Scripture really closely, that is not what Jesus is saying. He is saying, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Now, that doesn't mean we just tack on in Jesus' name on the end of a prayer and say, oh, that's got to be in Jesus' name. Look at the rest of it. So that the Father may be glorified. What's the prayer request? Something that will just benefit another person? No. Nope. Something that will just give prestige and honor to the prayer? No. Nope. The reason here is that the Father is glorified. All the things that we do as humans don't glorify God. All the things that we wind up doing in the church don't necessarily glorify God. And so we have to be careful here. Are we asking things that can really honor and glorify God? Are there things that's going to benefit other people for the cause of Christ? Jesus, this is so important, he, he reiterates it again in verse 14. You may ask, for, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Ask anything in my name. Don't forget the phrase, to glorify God. So is prayer important? Yes. Praying for things. All of in things are in the realm of, in the will of Jesus for the glorification of God. So I think this will, will, will stem, if we really understand these two verses, stem a lot of our requests. 
He's not saying don't ask. He's saying ask. But when we pray, we must pray that God's will is done, that God's will is in the prayer, and that God is going to be glorified by what we pray. So this entire lesson, again, as we've talked about so many times in this whole series, about choices. We've got a choice. Except Jesus, who He is, what He came to do, what He came and did, or reject Him. To reject Jesus is to reject God. To, to uh, identify Jesus as just a good teacher, a, a, a good miracle worker, and not identify Jesus as God in the flesh is to reject Him. It doesn't matter what, what group, what body of uh, religious people they are, if they reject Jesus as Messiah, if they reject Jesus as the Christ, if they reject Jesus as uh, the living Son of God, then they're rejecting their avenue to heaven. They're rejecting their salvation. They're rejecting any way of pleasing God. Jesus is God's wisdom sent to us. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you that you have sent Jesus to reveal who you are. Help us, Father, to... Let Him live in our lives through the Spirit. And may His Word, which is truth, be implanted and grow in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen.